All right, hey guys, welcome to uh, 9.2. In this video, we're gonna look a little bit at adaptations. Uh, let's jump into it. Okay, so what do we mean by adaptation? An adaptation is a genetically controlled feature that is going to enhance the survival of an organism in a particular environment, right? Um, now, what it means is that when we are talking about adaptations, we are talking about something that is genetic. It is genetically controlled, meaning that it's innate or inbuilt, which is different from a learnt behavior. So for example, here's an example of a bird that is learnt to use bread to hunt fish. Uh, and that's a learnt behavior that over the course of the lifetime, that is what the bird has learned to do. And most likely um, that learnt behavior is not passed on to its offspring, okay? Um, whereas with an adaptation, because it's innate, it's part of the genetics and it can be passed on to the offspring. Um, it, adaptations also enhance survival. So the ability to fit in and is shaped by natural selection. Um, and adaptations really only apply in a particular environment. So an adaptation is good in that particular environment that it survives in. So for example, work, lungs work really well on land, but if you uh, you know jump in the water, it's going to not be so good at surviving in the water. And therefore we say it is maladaptive when it has the opposite effect of not adapting. Uh, there are three types of adaptations which we're going to go through, which is structural adaptations, which relates to the physical or morphological form, behavioral adaptations, how an organism behaves, and physiological or functional adaptations, which is relating to how an organism functions. Okay. Uh, now, before we talk about adaptations, we do have to talk about the tolerance range of an organism. Uh, the tolerance range is referring to the range of environmental conditions that the organism can survive in. And that has kind of three things in particular. So here's the, um, the tolerance range. Um, there's an optimum range, which is, you know, the organism is going to thrive, it's going to be able to reproduce and live kind of indefinitely. Uh, in that particular range of condition. Uh, and then you have what we call the range of physiological stress. So outside of the optimum range, it's like the organism will survive, but it's not going to survive very well. So that, you know, the number of population that can survive there is actually very low. And likewise, on the other end of the spectrum, if it's too much, they, they will be stressed out and they will eventually, uh, you know, it's going to strain to continue to survive. And then you have the zone of intolerance. The zone of intolerance is when the organism cannot tolerate that particular condition and will die under prolonged exposure, which can obviously range between organisms and species. Um, every organism has a tolerance range for different factors in the environment. So for example, it could be temperature tolerance range or a pH tolerance range, the amount of oxygen in the air or the water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And usually it's referring to an abiotic factor. Um, and the ranges of different animals are going to differ uh, because or according to their adaptations, right? So here's an example of the oxygen levels in fish. So the black striped minnows have a wider tolerance range. So here's black striped minnows here, and then that's the black tail shiner. You might find them in the same environment, right? But uh, in this case, let's say that particular environmental condition could be something like oxygen levels, right? So for example, um, they have a wider tolerance range uh, and therefore are more likely to be found in a series of different waterways as a result of that. Um, your black tail shiners um, have both a narrow tolerance range and a higher lower limit, which means that particular level of oxygen, right? It needs to be higher percentage of oxygen in the water and they also can't tolerate as much. So usually you're gonna find the shiners in oxygen rich water, right? Uh, here is a prediction you can have to try. If the waterways are polluted, what would you expect uh, to happen to these two particular populations of fish, right? Which one's gonna survive, which one is not going to survive and now compete the other, right? Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, have a think about that. Uh, another example, uh, thermal tolerance in fish. So for example, here is a particular waterway in, um, in Vancouver, and you can see there that the, the, the rivers, the waterway here, um, there are populations of, uh, you know, types of fish living in each of these particular places. And I wouldn't get too worried too much about this, but the idea here is the temperature tolerance range for these species, um, across 
uh, you know, ranges from depending on where they live. So for example, this green one, the Quesnel one, that one, uh, the Quesnel is, uh, you know, kind of quite lower end in the scale um, from about, you know, under 10 degrees to a maximum maybe 20 something. However, um, you know, uh, other species like for example, the orange one down here, they can tolerate higher ranges of temperature from 15 uh, to high to mid twenties, um, but they're more narrow in their range. So, you know, outside of that, you're not gonna survive. So you can see there, you know, if you took populations from one spot uh, and moved it to another spot, they're not gonna survive so well because of those changes, or they're gonna survive really well because of their adaptation. So these species here, the early stewards, probably have a slightly different adaptations to, for example, these species here, the Gates one, as a result of the adaptations that they have. So um, when we think about that, you know, that tolerance range, when you have something that is going to uh, approach or limit the tolerance of an organism, we call it a limiting factor, right? So limiting factors can be both abiotic or biotic, right? So an abiotic example would be something like temperature. Like let's say if the temperature is too hot in this particular environment, then we would say the temperature is a limiting factor for this particular population of introduced animals or native animals or whatever. Um, biotic factors can be things like competition or predation, and they can also be limiting factors because they're gonna limit the survival, the tolerance of the organism in that particular location. Um, so for example, you know, if you think about rainforest, you know, one of the limiting factors that you might have in rainforest uh, could actually be sunlight at the um at the uh the undergrowth of the rainforest because it gets blocked out by the trees which is ironic because in rainforest you often have a lot of sunlight at the top but it actually shades out a lot of the plants down the bottom and we will say that in the bottom on the ground floor that would be um the limiting factor uh in the intertidal zone the limiting factor could be the tides themselves so for example um you know at low tide all of this gets exposed and they're exposed to the heat and etc and it'll be out of water and the animals can desiccate uh, however when it's high tide the whole thing's underwater and and you have a different set of limiting factors um if you were in a stagnant pond oxygen level might be a limiting factor because the organisms uh, living there don't have a lot of fresh water coming in unless it rains and then you know cycling oxygen in and out uh, of with the air uh, desert temperatures could be a limiting factor and you know cold temperatures or, or snow or even water availability in in here could also be a limiting factor right so that anything could pretty much be a limiting factor so how do organisms then survive? Well, we'll, let's look at the three types of adaptations. Now, this is very much a shotgun of the rest of the chapter on different types of adaptations. Uh, and so the principle is then backed up by lots of common examples that you will see in animals or not so common examples, okay? So when we talk about structural adaptations, we are talking about the physical or the morphological features that enhance the organism's survival. Now this could be uh, ranging from all sorts of things. So for example, in animals, that could be camouflage. That is the um, spiny leaf insect, and that is the adult, but that's actually the offspring, and they actually look remarkably like an ant. That's an ant, and that's the, the spiny leaf insect um, larvae, and they are the juveniles actually look and behave and walk around like ants, um, and that's an adaptation, right? They look and they, they, they behave well. The adults, on the other hand, look like sticks, and so they blend really well in the environment. Uh, other examples of uh, something that is not camouflage, but like camouflage, is actually what we call counter. Excuse me, um, is actually called counter shading. So in marine organisms, you're going to actually notice that a lot of them, animals and fish and so forth, actually have a really dark top uh, part, the dorsal component uh, part of their body, but then a really light ventral. Uh, part of the underbelly uh, and you can see that in penguins you'll see it in sharks and that actually has everything to do with the ability of those organisms to um, actually uh, you know from from the top or other organisms like prey or predator can't see them so well because the ocean is dark from the top looking down but from the bottom looking up it's quite bright so it's going to blend really well by those two particular parts right uh, oops, sorry, 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 my bad. I went, I went forward by accident. Um, and other examples of structural adaptation could be an ornamental traits that are going to attract mates. So for example, you know, this 
is the long-tailed widow bird, and that's the male, quite a very exquisite specimen of with a really, 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 really inconveniently long tail. And in fact, it's actually bad for the survival of the bird because it's it's hard to fly around with such a long and heavy tail. Um, and the purpose of that is actually just to attract a mate by having a really long tail. For some reason, you know, females are you know they love it and they're very attracted to it. Uh, and that is the female. She looks very dull, very boring compared to the very kind of colorful, rich, vibrant looking male with the really long tail. Um, and it's speculated that actually, you know, the reason why they're attracted to these long tails is be much to do with the ability of the uh, male to not only have the long tail and make it look really nice and flashy, but actually still not be dead because of like, you know, not able to fly or being eaten by predators. So, you know, it is a resemblance of like, or a semblance of like fitness, if you will, in that example. In fact, they even did an experiment where they actually chopped off the tails of some males and grafted onto other males, which had shorter tails. And then the females would then actually go and mate with those other males that have an artificially long tail as opposed. So it's actually very, very well documented there. Okay, other examples of structural uh, adaptations could be adaptations for temperature. So you're gonna notice that um, one of the things that, you know, in cold environments, animals uh, tend to be larger in body size, and that larger size allows them to retain heat better because larger objects have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. So for example, you know, these are all your species of bears, and as you kind of make your way up, they actually get larger, and the polar bear being the largest lives in the coldest environments. Same with the Siberian tiger. You can see there, here's a little uh, video of the Siberian tiger, um, you know, and there is your Siberian tiger, and these are your Bengal tigers, and they're tiny compared to this big fellow, and he is huge and intimidating. They're all freaking out because of him. Um, uh, other examples could be uh, thick fur, so animals uh, that have um, winter coats. So this is a corgi with... Um, with, 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 with a winter coat that's just been shedded and you can see that pretty much, you know, doubles the size of the animal. There's a hair with a winter coat that's been shedded on the onset of spring. Um, animals that don't have coats and things like that might have something like blubber to insulate. So, you know, uh, here is uh, a blue whale. This is a blue whale here. And then uh, the largest animal in the world. And, and, and here is the blue whale's blubber, the a layer of fat to insulate. That's a that's an adaptation. Having that extra layer of fat is gonna insulate the whale really well and keep it warm so that it can survive even in Arctic waters, etc. Uh, otters have actually the thickest fur. They don't have blubber, even though they live in really cold environments, they have the thickest fur of any animal. Um, and uh, they're you know, very cute and stuff, they're very fluffy uh, organisms with these really awesome structural adaptations for temperature. Now, when we talk about temperature, we also need to talk about uh, how there are two kind of general categories of temperature. Organisms are usually classified according to how they regulate their body temperature. So um, you have the endotherms uh, and the ectotherms. Endotherms are organisms that can generate heat internally. So we commonly refer to them as warm-blooded. Um, and we're mainly talking about animal, mammals and birds. Um, where the animal's activity doesn't have to align with ambient temperature. They can be active throughout most of the day and the night, but they require more energy to be constantly active. So here's an example of the bobcat and the snake, and you can see the snake's an ectotherm and the, the uh, bobcat's an endotherm, and the body temperature of the bobcat sits at around about 37 uh, degrees, uh, and it can sustain that despite the fact that the ambient temperature can go up and down at any point, and it's gonna always be um, you know, 37 degrees because the bobcat uses its food and produces energy out of that. Um, so when we say that it has a consistent internal temperature, uh, we also refer to the word homeothermic. So these two terms, they don't mean the same thing, but they're often used together. Often endothermic organisms are homeothermic because they have a consistent internal temperatures. Okay. But there are other types, you know, you can have ectothermic with homothermic, homeothermic as well. Um, so here's a lion in um, using infrared, and you can see there the the, uh, the lion has a very insulating layer of hair around there, and so not a lot of heat can be seen coming out of the lion, but you can see a lot coming out of the eyes and the body and the inside parts of its limbs um, being releasing heat that it has produced in its own body. This is the hummingbird. Hummingbirds have the highest metabolism of any species. And they can eat up to about a half of their body weight in food every day just to sustain this kind of flight. And they are, you know, one of the smallest birds in the world uh, with the fastest wing beat. 
uh, in the world. Um, and in order to do that, they need to have a really high metabolism. They burn through a lot of energy. So they have to have a lot of high energy foods like nectar rich, uh, things like that. So pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, now, ectotherms. So ectotherms are organisms that depend on external sources of heat to regulate the body temperature. Uh, we commonly refer to them as cold-blooded, even though it's not entirely accurate because uh, their blood's not cold all the time. It's really just aligns with the ambient temperature. They include things like reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates. And in general, the trade-off is that you require less energy, but you can't be as active in your mobility, right? So that, that's a person and there, there's a snake. You can see there the person generates their own body heat, but the snake, that's going to match the ambient temperature. So you see quite low and the snake's not a super active animal as a result of that. Uh, and you know, certain species of reptiles and, and animals uh, that are ectothermic will eat a meal and they actually don't have to feed again for a very long time because that one meal is going to sustain them in terms of energy levels. And so an anaconda eating a fully grown uh, you know, a mammal could probably survive for several months without eating again, uh, just purely off that energy. Whereas you and I, you know, being endothermic, uh, we will need to eat about three times a day. And so we have to eat regularly and we have to eat um, a lot just to keep our body temperatures up. Another term for a lot of ectotherms are what we call poikilothermic. So the opposite of uh, homeothermic is poikilo, meaning that they have variable internal temperature um, and that temperature is going to go up and down throughout the uh, coinciding with a lot of the environment. So here's a red bellied black snake and you can see here's the time of day and night uh, and the body temperature of the snake you can see. Um, you know, when dawn happens, uh, they're going to emerge from their overnight burrows and then they're going to bask for a bit to warm up. And then you're going to see there this kind of in and out movement between the sun and the shade to make sure that its temperature is regulated. And then what happens is at nighttime, they're going to go back into their burrow and they're going to cool down. And it's going to drop back down and then it just recycle, you know, resets itself every day, right? As a result of the variable internal temperature. Now, uh, if you look at the structures uh, of uh, endothermic and ectothermic, um, uh, sorry, not the structures, the range, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, endothermic organ mammals and things like that living in the water can actually have a higher range. And so they actually range all the way from the top of the Arctic down to the bottom of the Antarctic, simply because they survive better in those kind of environments. Ectotherms, on the other hand, um, you know, generally rely on warm water to survive. So um, they will survive somewhere around, have a more narrow range because they can't generate their own uh, energy source. You'll never find really a reptile in the snow because they just can't survive the cold temperatures all the time or in cold waters. Okay. Uh, there's a very strong correlation between um, kind of also their metabolic rate and the growth rate between endotherms and ectotherms. In general, endotherms will have a high metabolism and a higher growth rate as a result of that uh, compared to your ectotherms uh, with a few exceptions. And then you got your dinosaurs that are kind of like in the middle between the two. Okay, there are a few exceptions. So here are some really cool exceptions of uh, organisms that have really awesome temperature regulation, sharks and tunas, right? Both tuna and sharks are an example of organisms that are able to become endothermic um, despite the fact that they are fish, right? Uh, and it's not a, not, a, not a common example of an endotherm, right? Um, both use what we call a countercurrent heat exchange, and I'll explain what that is later on, uh, where they are able to actually recycle the heat that is usually lost to the surrounding water. Um, and tuna have what we, we consider as red muscles, which are higher oxygen binding abilities that actually allows them to burn their metabolism and keep it at a higher rate. So, so you know, the tuna's body cavity uh, or the body, um, you know, is really, really actually quite warm in the middle. And then as you make your way on the outside, it cools down a lot, thank, uh, matching the ambient temperature. Uh, great white sharks have a really large size and so they have what we call gigantothermy and so that large size just means that heat escapes the body a lot slower um, and as a result they can maintain a homeothermic internal temperature. Okay, let's look at structural adaptations in plants. Now, there's a bit of a, a mixed bag of adaptations. So I'm going to go through a few of them with you guys because they are the ones present in your book. Um, but um, in general, when we think about uh, structural adaptations in plants, we're focusing a lot on 
temperature and water balance in plants, okay? So plants are classified according to their type of environment. You can have what we call a hydrophyte, which grows in water. You can have a mesophyte, which is terrestrial. And then you can also have a xerophyte, which grow in dry and hot environments. Water being a key factor of photosynthesis um, means that a lot of the adaptations we're gonna go through really just actually revolves around water. Uh, this includes stomata adaptations, so being able to um, have traits that allow them to maximize their photosynthesis is really important for plants. So, um, you know, a few examples uh, is that, um, you know, uh, the, the plant stomata might be, um, you know, placed usually on the underside of the leaf. Um, sometimes plants will reduce the amount of stomata they have. So for example, cacti will have stomata, um, you know, uh, less of them uh, on their surface to really reduce the amount of the water they're gonna lose. Um, they might have a sunken stomata, where what, what happens is the stomata is actually in a little ditch, and what that's gonna do is gonna prevent the wind from pushing the water away too quickly and slow down the loss in um, dry environments. Um, you can have rolled leaves, so this is a rolled leaf where the stomata is actually on the inside, and that's, once again, that rolled leaf means that um, any water that's being lost through the stomata pores here are going to then um, be sitting inside this little groove um, and then sheltered from the wind and doesn't actually get carried off by the wind and evaporative loss is reduced as a result of that. Um, you can have a thick cuticle, so you know a thick waxy cu cuticle in a lot of desert plants means that they, they've got this kind of thick uh, waxy feel and they're quite tough um, and, and, and dry, but it means that they will conserve water a lot better. Um, sometimes uh, leaf size, orientation, and shape play a really big role as well, um, particularly in hot environments. So in Australia, you notice that a lot of eucalyptus leaves have uh, a, like a vertical, they dangle straight down. There's actually an adaptation for that. So having vertical leaves instead of horizontal leaves means that as the sun comes up, um, you know, in the early dawn, it's going to hit the, the leaf. Um, head on and that's really useful because that allows the plant to photosynthesize. However, during the midday when the sun's above the plant, um, the, the light's going to filter through the leaf and it's not going to hit the leaf so that during the hottest part of the day, this, the, the eucalyptus leaves is not going to burn because of the sunlight, but it's only going to catch the morning and the evening sun and photosynthesize in those times. It's also why eucalyptus leaves, um, they, they, they're dark green on both sides rather than your typical plant that is dark green on the top but then light green down the bottom because uh, the amount of chloroplast is uh, evenly spread on both sides of the leaf to catch both the morning and the evening sun. Um, plants also have an extensive root system to actually gather uh, water. So a lot of plants have what we call a tap root where they will actually just grow vertically until they hit water and then they will start to branch out as a result of that. So you can have tap roots and you can have fibrous roots uh, and the tap roots are better suited for um, deep ground uh, water access. Um, all right, let's talk about physiological. So physiological is referring to the internal body processes that enhances the survival of the organism. Um, and that physiological process or an adaptation usually improves homeostasis. Um, and it, you know, uh, it makes effective predation or avoiding predation, right? So um, it's gonna help them eat things or it's going to help avoid being eaten as a result of those uh, processes, right? Uh, it's probably worth noting that, um, you know, the way the body works also relies on structural changes, right? So um, I'll give an example in a second, but uh, the idea is that you need to have the accompanying structural traits to match your physiological adaptation. So a lot of animals that have physiological adaptations will have internal structural adaptations to match that. Uh, here's the spinifex hopping mouse and uh, it lives in central Australia and it um, lives in spinifex and one of the interesting traits is that the kidneys have a really long loop of Henle. Here's a regular loop of Henle and then here's the loop of Henle of the spinifex hopping mouse and um, what the loop of Henle does is it actually um, retains water. So the longer the loop of Henley, the better the water retention abilities. And the Spinifex hopping mouse has the best water retention ability of any small mammal in the world um, because of this really long loop of Henley. So, you know, water retention being a physiological adaptation, but that's accompanied by a long structural loop of Henley. Um, physiological 
ad adaptations to animals can also include things like the counter current heat exchange that I mentioned earlier. What it is, is an arrangement of blood vessels that are going to line the arteries and the veins close together, right? So an organism without counter current heat exchange might experience, um, you know, warm blood coming from the body through metabolism at 37 degrees as it goes towards the limbs, it's going to drop. The temperature is going to drop because it gets cold on the outside, right? So it might drop from 37 to 32 to 28. And then, um, you know, 24, 21, 18, and 16. And then by the time it becomes, uh, the blood travels through the arch, um, the arteries, through the uh, capillaries and into the veins and returns to the heart, the temperature might be really big dip a really big drop now that's not always advantageous in cold environments because what it does is it cools down the core body of the organism and that's not a great thing to have because then your organs can fail as a result of that um, and so instead if you arrange the arteries and the veins to become very close together the heat from the arteries leaving the heart is going to naturally transfer into the veins over time um, as it makes its way down the edge. And so the temperature is going to drop and it's going to drop more drastically. So it goes from 37, 29, 22, 15, for example, right? Because they are mixing the heat between the arteries and the veins. But the advantage is that when the arteries make their way away from the heart, they're going to cool down significantly. But when the veins make their way towards the heart, they're going to warm up significantly. So the core temperature isn't going to change all that much. And that's really useful because that means your organs aren't going to fail, right? So long as your, you know, your limbs don't get gang, uh, frostbite or something like that, generally speaking, you will survive quite well. So a lot of birds, like penguins, for example, right, in the, in the Antarctic, um, they, um, you know, their, their feet are going to be standing on snow. And so that's really, really cold. You don't want that heat, uh, that, that, that cold, um, you know, making its way towards the, organs and so that counter current heat exchange is going to be really useful in making sure that none of that heat get heads up towards where the organs are um but you know the the legs they're not going to be super active all the time right um another physiological adaptations in animals include uh, the process of torpor torpor is when you lower your metabolic rate to save energy and you have different variations of torpor according to the type of animal that you are talking about right when it is really long and it happens like over winter we call that hibernation so bears for example will hibernate over the winter and what they do is they're going to decrease their body temperature and heart rate to as low as they can possibly go and they're going to go into this kind of deep sleep um, and kind of the body just kind of shuts down. So that way, if the, the it doesn't, they don't use up a lot of energy over the winter because they're not going to be able to sustain it. Um, it occurs in a lot of mammals and some birds. And what the animal does, it relies on fat storage to survive on kind of like a, a sleep mode or a, um, a resting mode. And then at the end, they're going to come out and they're going to like super skinny and they're going to eat, uh, you know, heaps and heaps of food during the spring. Um, if, uh, if it occurs in reptiles, we actually call that brumation or, or brumation, um, where basically the, the reptile, because it's already cold blooded, it just does less things and it just goes into a lazy mode where it doesn't eat, but it will still wake up and drink water and so forth. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, 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 it just does less activities, right? Uh, when you have hibernation, hot or dry environments, we actually call that, um, estivation. Uh, and that will occur in insects, fish, and amphibians. Uh, like for example, the, the Spencer's burrowing frog will bury itself in the desert ground uh, where it's a little bit moist. And it's going to encase itself in this kind of mucus membrane and it's going to shut down for the really hot parts of summer and it will come out during the wet season. Uh, plants also have physiological adaptations. So um, here is an example, a really good example of a category of plants that can utilize what we call CAM photosynthesis. Now, the word CAM or the, the acronym CAM stands for, I don't know how to pronounce this correctly, Crassilisian, um, uh Acid Metabolism. And it is a physiological method of storing carbon dioxide for photosynthesis later on, right? So CAM plants, they do things a little bit differently, right? So uh, what happens is the CAM plants are gonna open their stomata at night and carbon dioxide is gonna move into the plant. And the carbon dioxide is then actually stored and it's gonna be converted into a type of uh, compound called malic acid. And the malic acid is gonna sit in the vacuole of the plant. 
And what happens is during the day, the stomata is gonna close, preventing new CO2 from coming in, but then the plant is going to then metabolize the malic acid and turn that back into CO2, where it can be then be used as part of photosynthesis and produce the energy that the plant needs. So uh, what that means is the plant is kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, staggering when the stomata is going to be open and then when they're going to use the carbon dioxide to grow. And that's really advantageous for a lot of um, desert plants that rely on um, having their stomata, uh, you know, closed during the hot summer day to prevent um, water loss, right? So, uh, you know, these are all the examples of kind of your, your cam plants there, right? Uh, actually, I don't know if these are all examples. I think only your desert examples, the cactus are the examples of camp plants. Okay, um, plants also have physiological adaptations for frost and salt. So, um, you know, frost being very damaging towards plants for a few reasons. When water expands, uh, so when water, water is frozen, it expands and that can damage the cell walls and cell membranes of plants. Uh, and so frozen water uh, is a really bad spell, you know, is a really bad thing for plants um, because it also stops enzyme activities. A lot of the plants are made of water and so therefore it's going to pause metabolism, which is bad for plants. I mean, it's bad for animals as well, but you know, we have a different set of adaptations that allow us to survive and we try to prevent that by having uh, a really warm body. Um, frost or frozen water also doesn't move up the xylem vessels because they're frozen. So you can't really uh, transport that up the plant. And that means the plant's not going to be able to photosynthesize despite all the sunlight in the world. So plants, uh, some plants um, can combat this. And what they do is they actually accumulate high concentrations of sugars and salt to reduce the freezing point of water inside their cells so that water can still move. So um, if you put a lot of ions like sugars and salt, it actually makes it harder for water to freeze. So plants will do that by concentrating sugars in their cells uh, to allow the cells to remain in liquid form and the water doesn't freeze. Uh, plants also have salt tolerance. So here's an example of mangroves and mangroves live in brackish to, uh, you know, um, uh, salt water. And what me what happens is then uh, the plant faces a bit of a problem because um, if you have too much salt in the cells, there's an ion imbalance and then it's going to prevent metabolic processes from happening. And so what plants can do is they can actually um, combat that by compartmentalizing the excess salt into uh, certain vacuoles and they're going to keep them from affecting the rest of the plant. Um, they can stash them in old leaves um, and then they're going to shed and drop the leaves into the ground um, or they can actually pump salt out of the, the, um, the plant uh, leaf itself. Uh, and so you see there, here's a mangrove leaf with the salt being pushed out of the plant as a result of that process happening, yeah, through these roots or glands in the plant. Now, adaptations uh, that involve behavior. So behavior can also be an adaptation. Now, when behavior is learnt, uh, it can sometimes be lost within the organism and it's not considered really as an adaptation. Um, however, if the behavior can be um, you know, passed on to the offspring, we would then consider that as a, an adaptation, okay? And it's a bit of a blurred line because uh, learnt behavior over many generations can actually become innate over time. Uh, that's kind of how it starts, really becomes part of your genes. Um, so uh, behavior adaptations being uh, inherent behaviors that are gonna enhance survival, uh, they pass on to the, genera uh, the next generation. And here's some examples. So for example, communal living in herds and packs, the natural um, desire for organisms to live together in groups uh, is a behavioral adaptation that they've, you know, over time just adapted to be able to do that. Um, the, uh, the ability to pant in dogs, that's an adaptation. Dogs don't really have sweat glands, so to actually cool themselves down, they actually pant quite rapidly using their tongue to evaporate a lot of water from that. And that's going to reduce their core body temperature uh, from overheating. Um, huddling. So here are emperor penguins in the Antarctic. And you can see this kind of weird, funny behavior of them pushing uh, each other. And uh, emperor penguins will actually huddle to survive against the most extreme parts of the cold in the Antarctic. And basically, um, that process will actually uh, will actually kind of rotate 
between individuals and they will actually push individuals from the inside get pushed out and that rotation is going to then evenly spread the exposure of the cold to the outside organisms uh, and then kind of help the ones that are huddled on the inside as well okay uh, web building in spiders and then migration in uh, a lot of animals are all kind of behavior adaptations um, plants also have uh, believe it or not a uh, behavioral uh, adaptations um, and that includes things like tropism so tropism is when the plant grows in response to environmental factors so um, these can be a variety of conditions so for example if it's uh, growing to face the sunlight we call that phototropism if it is growing to um, respond to gravity we call that geotropism um, you know if it's responding to touch it's stigmatropism responding to water it's hydrotropism and when it's responding to chemicals in the ground, we call that chemotropism, right? So, so you know, if you have a plant uh, kind of in a pot and then you move the light source, actually the plant will then grow to try and direct itself towards that particular side. And the way it does that is that it actually secretes, uh, uh, sorry, it releases a hormone that extends the growth on the part of the plant that's going to then point the growth or the rest of the plant growth into that particular direction by elongating that lower cell layer there. Um, as a response to the effect of that, uh, the light or the whatever. So there's a plant growing to face over time uh, the light. This plant here, let's say uh, you know you push the plant and the stem flops over to the side, it's going to regrow back up to try and combat um, you know the gravity or or, or sunlight. Um, now that's let's talk about plant growth, right? Um, plants can move not in the sense that we can move by contraction of muscles, but they can move in response, that's meant to say response to a stimulus, and we call that nastic movement, right? So a good example is the Venus flytrap, where they have these little um, these little sensors inside the Venus flytrap, and if an insect kind of triggers two or more of those um, little spines, then the leaf is designed to then close and trap the insect in there. And then the Venus flytrap will then actually, you know, release um, uh, enzymes to then digest the insect. Um, another one is uh, this here. Uh, I can't exactly, uh, I can't exactly remember what it's called, but it's like a type of, um, a type of leaf where if you touch it, it's gonna then kind of rapidly close to protect itself. And that's a type of nastic movement there as well. Um, the flowering of plants during the course of the day, that is a type of nastic movement as well. Um, although it's, it's kind of coupled together with growth, okay? Um, all right, I think that's it for this particular chapter. I hope you guys enjoyed that and I'll see you guys in 9.3.